Be fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. Welcome to Trina Talk. Trina Talk is a weekly podcast that will inspire and empower women of all ages to strive for the impossible. Your host, Trina L. Martin from TrinaMartin.com is a motivational speaker, leader, and cybertech expert. Every week, Trina will share wisdom gained from her life experiences and lessons learned while pursuing her goals to inspire you to achieve the next level in your life. Now, your host, Trina L. Martin. Hello, welcome to Trina Talk. I am your host, Trina L. Martin, and this is episode 30. The topic of this week's episode is finding your fears. My guest this week is Nicole Roberts-Jones. Nicole is uniquely gifted at one thing, and that's drawing out what's best in you and helping take your brilliance to the bank. A veteran of the entertainment industry, Nicole worked in talent management and casting before shifting her talents to become the founder and CEO of Fierce Factor Lab. She now works with entrepreneurs to create multiple streams of income from what they already know in order to build an empire from their expertise. Additionally, Nicole works with corporations to assure their executives and middle managers push their internal edge and step into the true power of their gifts and talents at work. Hello, Nicole. Thank you for joining me. Yay. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. I am so excited that you're here with me. You are just a one amazing lady. You are an author, you're a CEO, but you had this fabulous career before you decided to start your own business. Can you go into depth and talk about that? Sure. And and I, I love that you started out of the gate asking this question because literally I thought I was doing great, you know, and and if you looked at my resume at the time, I looked really, really successful. Matter of fact, I had the job I always dreamed of. So this was back in 1993. At the time, I worked for Viacom's largest cable network. We had an outreach to 89 million homes on a weekly basis. And then from there, I got elevated into a casting position and I worked for the number one TV show on Fox. And then from there, I got offered a position working with a production group. And what we produced, we generated over $12.6 billion a year. So I'm saying that just so you can see the landscape of what I was doing. But you got to know also I was going to all the hot Hollywood parties, right? I was mm-hmm. bumping elbows with stars, people you've seen on TV and it looked at them film. And, you know, I might have dated one or two. So <laughs> I was living the dream life, right? But it had become my nightmare. And I say that because... I felt like every morning, a little piece of me died to live my dream. Now, mind you, this was my dream since I was little. And for some reason, I felt like something was missing. And every time, Trina, I talked to one of my girlfriends, they kept saying, no, now, wait a minute, Nicole, have you lost your mind? Didn't we go to this party? And didn't we get on the red carpet? And didn't we go here? And, and so I was totally, utterly confused. So in the middle of me uh, being confused, like, how am I feeling like something's missing when I'm living this quote unquote dream, right? Um, one of my girlfriends invited me to volunteer with her one Friday night at a youth program at our church. And as I walked into the walls of that church that night, and I started working with young women, as their eyes lit up, my heart lit up. And I realized, oh my God, this is it. This is the thing I'm meant to do. But this was 1993. There was no such thing as a coach. This wasn't glamorous. <laughs> and nobody was beating down any kind of wall to do this work. But for the first time, my soul was alive. So I had a decision to make. And I'm starting with this because some of you that are listening right now, you're in the place of that decision. Do you do the thing that everybody knows you for, the perception, who you're supposed to be? Or do you do the thing that's rumbling in your spirit? And so that is, in essence, Trina, I chose the thing that was wrong with my spirit, scared to death, didn't know what the heck I was doing. But 1993, I started this mission, and I call it that moment, that epiphany moment. I call it the moment that I found my fears. Wow. That's amazing, because I have done something similar, but you 
or on a grand scale? And how do you do that? Because a lot of people are wrapped up in their title Mm -hmm. and, you know, I work for this company and I'm this position. Was that difficult for you to, to, like you said, let it go that you're rubbing elbows with some celebrities and you're, Mm -hmm. you're, you're you're invited to the hottest parties and you're, you're in, right? You're in that group. Mm -hmm. Was that difficult? Uh, let me keep it all the way real. I still miss the parties. It's almost 26 <laughs> years later. So it was very, very difficult. But here's the thing. My, what I realized in that moment is that my soul was calling me to more. And my soul, I know, is God. And yeah. if God is calling me to more, if I stayed in the place where I wasn't supposed to be at some point, it gets worse and worse and worse. And Trina, I know what well, I'm talking about me because, you know, Trina, you might not have had this experience like relationships that you know you should it should have been over but you stay Mm -hmm. and it gets worse and worse and worse right I got plenty of stories about those right (laughs) so so in that moment it was a really hard decision to make and it wasn't an overnight decision so like I decided this Saturday morning the next day girl took me uh probably like three years before I left but um but I began to try to find resources for myself I began to try to educate myself I began to try to read books about this thing because there was no such thing as a coach in 1993 um, and so really what I began to do, what I would recommend people now is find someone 10 steps ahead of you that has been in the journey you're trying to do instead of you trying to figure, it took me too long to figure it out because I didn't know anyone to go to. Um, but that really, it was hard. Um, all my friends thought I had lost my mind. Now that I'm 26 years in and they see where I am now, they're like, oh, I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm, but girl, you was the one t- saying, Nicole, you lost your dang old mind 26 years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was very hard. But but here's the other thing I know. Every person that's been called to do anything great has had to do it afraid. So when I think of Moses, right? mm-hmm. not that I know Moses, you know, that was a whole <laughs> long, long time ago. But when I imagine Moses now, you know, maybe you've been saved all your life, Trina. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, if God said to me, I'm going to mm-hmm. give you a stick. And you got 2,000 people behind you and you go stick a stick in the sea and it's going to part. I'd be like, for real, Lord, you don't want Trina to do that? You want me to do that? <laughs> right? I know, right? <laughs> right, right. And Mary, if you think about Mary, we, we hear the story of Mary, Jesus's mother all the time. Mm-hmm. She was engaged, right? She probably had the perfect successful life. Just think about it for a minute. She had the successful life. She's probably in all the social groups and going to all the little parties that were out back then, right? And she's engaged to the super hot guy named Joseph. So her life is made. And then this angel comes in the middle of the night and disrupts her life. Oh, yeah. See, when, you, when God is calling you to more, it's always a disruption. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. That, oh man, that is just, that's profound right there. Mm-hmm. It's always a disruption because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Wow, that that is just and I'm glad you said that it took you three years before you went all in and that you you did your homework and you were preparing yourself and you're going through personal development, because a lot of times people think that, you know what, I, I get this feeling and I'm quitting my job today and I'm going mm-hmm. and it's like, mm-hmm. no, you still got bills. Right, to you pay. Know what? Well, let me say, I love you say that because I say this to people all the time, you know, and, and people say stuff like I'm stepping out on faith and I'm on now don't blame that on God because there's a <laughs> book called Proverbs in the Bible that's a book of wisdom and mm-hmm. you quitting right now is not wise because how are you gonna eat exactly God calls us to be wise I mean this free will yes he wants us to have faith yes but however he also wants you to have wise faith <laughs> oh <laughs> you yes <know>? yeah <laughs> yes faith without works is dead yeah yes. he just say be stupid hello and, and you know and that's that's what I want people to know that you can have that burning and that passion, but you have to go about it strategically. You have to be yes. smart. Yes. Yes. The one thing you know about God is he's strategic. He could have made the world in one day, mm. but he decided to do it in seven. Yes. He's strategic. Right. Mm-hmm. And so if God has to have strategy, come on now. I, mm-hmm. I'm sure I don't have to finish the rest of that sentence. Right. Mm-hmm. Even when I think about and I use this example all the time, David and Goliath, because we've all heard that story over and over and over again since we were little. Right. Right. And when you think about David and Goliath, David, 12 years old, he was probably little like Webster. Now, I don't know how old you are, Trina. And if you don't know who Webster is, I'm aging I, myself. I okay, I'm you guys, so I know. Okay, me too, girl. We're the same age. So listen. So, so those of you that don't know what Webster is, Google it, right? But he was a little, little, little short guy, mm-hmm. right? 12 years old, little, little Webster. And then when I think about the giant, I think about the rock. 
times 10 mm. in his fine self, right? Mm-hmm. So imagine the army wouldn't fight him. The Navy wouldn't fight him. The police wouldn't fight him. Nobody would fight the giant. But this little 12-year-old little boy said, I'll fight him. Yeah. So the thing I get from thinking about David, and if you really read the Bible, and I'm always going, when I talk about the Bible, this is a Bible according, uh, according to Nicole, because it's not like I went to seminary school or any of that. So, 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 so when I think about David, he was strategic because everybody else, I'm sure, was saying, guns, you need to get some swords. Well, no, I didn't have guns back then. You need swords. You need, you know, they were probably telling him all this stuff he needed. And he's like, Mm-mm, I'm clear on my gift is, is this slingshot. Right. And I'm sure he said, okay, I'm going to pull it back. I'm going to hit him in between his eyes. That's all strategy. Mm-hmm. So he didn't just run in there and go. And because if he would have done it like that, he would have failed. So everybody that quits your job today, because they have an idea, I'm going to tell you right now, you're setting yourself up for failure from the beginning. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I've heard a lot of other successful people say this, and this is kind of what I've done with my life, but you let that full-time job fuel you and, and, and pay for your passion. Yes. I, I, when, so when I first started this, I, I called it my daytime job and my nighttime calling. So mm. then I started calling my daytime job, my investor, because it invested in me being able to pay for my rent then mm-hmm. they over eventually mortgage <laughs> and let me pay for groceries. Cause, and here's the thing I want you to understand. What God had to show me was service and struggle should never coexist. Mm. Oh, yeah. So when you so are serving is- the world with your gift, and, and here's the other thing I have learned in my, and everything I, I, I share, I talk that, you know, I don't, I don't just talk to talk. I walk it. So everything I'm sharing with you is because I've been through it. So for me, what I realized is the reason why I was having that rump, in my spirit in 1993 is I was purposed for more. Mm -hmm. And it was that seed that God placed in me, right? So when God places a seed in you, he places the very thing in you that is meant to uh, you live abundantly. So that Bible verse, I've come that you have life and have it more abundantly. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I had to let go of having to serve people and not be paid for it. Wow. And, and you know what, and that's a good thing. And, and talk, more about that because Mm -hmm. people think because you decide that, okay, I want to start my own business, whatever that may be, Mm -hmm. they think you're playing and they think, oh yeah, okay, you're great at that, but can, can you help me? Can can you give me the hookup type of thing? Right. Right. And well, here's a couple of things that happened. That's one, right? And, and let me just say this to backtrack because, you know, I start getting excited and I, I, I talk in circles sometimes. So pull me back, Trina, because, you know, I start getting excited. (laughs) So, so the question you asked me, was not necessarily around this whole, um, uh, it was, it's really having your job be your investor. And I want you guys to get this. So I had to learn number one, that I needed to keep my job to be my investor because I needed to be able to pay for my ice, my mortgage, all that. But here's the other thing. You've got to spend money to make money. Mm. And what most people don't realize is in order for you, first, when your business is starting, you've got to number one, invest in a coach. Because if Mm -hmm. you don't know what the heck you're doing, you're not going to figure it out by yourself. I don't care how many extra hours you put in, right? And then the second thing you've got to do is be committed because there are people that need that gift in you, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, tell me the question you just asked me because I forgot going off on my tangent again. Um, Shoot, you know, I got caught up listening to you. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so we we talked about oh, I, know um, what it is. I, know, I know what it is, the service and struggle. So here's yes. the thing, right? So two things happen, right? One, people seem to think that they should get even your friends seem to think that they should get your service for free. And if you don't know your value, neither will they, you know, right. like uh, Steve Harvey says, if you give the cookie away for free, then you can't expect, you know, the ring to come. And I say the same thing in business. If you've been giving your, your gift away for free, anybody ever pay for it? Right. The second thing I see people do, now mind you, my best friend is a stylist. I pay her. She has gone through my programs and she's paid in full. And my husband mm-hmm. said, that's jacked up. I said, no, it's not. It's called make a living. I pay and her. She it. pays me. Mm-hmm. Right. Now I gave her a discount, but she still paid. So, mm-hmm. so the other thing is I see so many people say, well, aren't there other people that do this? There's so many other people that do this. Why would anybody pay for this? Or you think it's easy for you. So it's like, oh, this is, I, nobody's going to pay me for this. But you've got to understand that, no, everybody doesn't know how to do this. This Mm. is your gift. And people are coming to you because they see you as the answer to their problem. Mm. And it's your responsibility to invite them in a way that you can serve them to be the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really what being in business is about. And, 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 And understand when you don't know your value and you don't ask for the sale, then neither will they. Wow. And what you said as far as, 
people saying, well, there's other people who do this. And exactly, but this is this is a world. There's just someone who there's multiple people that do some of the same things, but mm-hmm. everyone mm-hmm. does it differently. Yeah, just think about this. Think about it like this. There's Beyonce, there's India Ari, mm-hmm. there is Don Ross. I mean, I keep naming singers. They all sing. They all right. out there doing it and they all do it in their own way. Mm-hmm. There's Alicia Keys. If you think about Alicia Keys and Beyonce, I wouldn't say either one, one was better than the other. You'll never see Alicia Keys doing a full on production, dancing down steps and all that. That's not who Alicia Keys is. Right. You will see her behind a piano and you'll mm-hmm. never see Beyonce sitting at a piano. That's just right. not who Beyonce is. So you've got to be clear on who you are and stick to it, understanding that nobody can do you like you. That's why, by the way, I, I call it finding your fierce because really I use Beyonce as my muse, right? And so when she used to be on stage, now I'm saying used to, I'm going to tell you why in a minute. When she first started her solo career, she had never done it out by herself before. So she made up this alter ego called Sasha Fierce so that she could stand into the most powerful her. So the reason I say that I found my fears is in that moment for me, I realized that I was staying in my full power of my gifts and I was doing it unapologetically. And it's really my mission in this thing called life that every woman stand in her fears. Now, here's the thing. In 2003, when Beyonce made up that, and mind you, I read that in a magazine. So if my years are off, it's because I read it in a magazine. So in 2003, when Beyonce did her solo career and, you know, came out with the Sasha person, right? Realized that around 2008, 2009, she stopped saying that. Do you know why? Hmm. She needed that alter ego so that she could be all of herself. Because it was, when you are so powerful, what's that quote by Marion Williamson? You know, you, you have more power in your, I'll look it up because I'm here, I ain't say the quote wrong. Look it up while I'm talking. But, but the, the, you're more powerful beyond measure. That's what it is. Hmm. It's your light, not your darkness that attracts people. And so for beyond, she knew she had the power, but she was scared of it. So that goes back to what I said earlier about doing it afraid. Same for her. She had to do it afraid. And so she had to create this alter ego so that she could do this thing and be all of herself and let that fear dissipate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what would now do it afraid? Now, how mm-hmm. would someone even do it? Because some, some people are shaking in their boots. Even mm-hmm. if, if, think about it they bust out in in sweat what would you suggest that someone take as the first step of doing it afraid be clear on why you're doing it because let me tell you I remember the very first time that now people look at me now and think that oh my god I've been speaking for 20 something years but understand I'm actually shy so if you guys ever see me in public and you think I'm being full of myself because I go sit by myself that's because I'm shy right? Nobody believes me. If I see you and I know you, I'll totally come up to you and scream and, hey, and talk. But if you see me come in the room and I'm sitting by myself, it's because, yeah, I'm having a moment. <laughs> but I remember in, in 1995, I, over time, my first hot coffee on doing this work, I started a, a program for African-American teenage girls at my church. Now this church in LA, 18,000 members. Okay. Mm-hmm. So anytime make an announcement in church about some program we were doing, I, <laughs> I would write it all up and then I'd coach one of my girls to do it. And I called it leadership development. <laughs> no, Nicole scared announcement in front of the church. So I had my babies do it. That's real talk. So uh-huh. I remember the first Sunday that, um, and the way my church worked, you'd have to submit the announcement on Tuesdays, pastor approve it and you come and do it. I submitted the, the announcement this particular Tuesday and pastor's assistant called me back and pastor, she says, pastor wants to actually do your announcement on Sunday. So just bring it in the pulpit. I was like, okay. So, girl, you got to know, I want my baddest outfit on that Sunday because I'm going to be sitting in the pulpit, right? Now I'm vain, too. I might be shy, but I'm also vain. So, so I get my little cute outfit. Go, uh, at the point in time, I go to the pulpit to hand the note to him to read, and he pulls my hand to come sit down. So now I'm waving at people, hey, girl, hey, you know. So then the way my church worked is we sang Spirit of the Living God. It's the AME church right before announcements, right? So I'm singing Spirit but I can't sing, but anyway. So I'm singing, still all excited and I'm trying to hand the pastor a note and he's not taking it. So then it's time for announcements. Do you know my pastor pushed me in front of the microphone? Ah. Uh. Now, let me tell you guys, I was shaking so hard. I could not read that piece of paper. I don't even know if my words, you know, went together. I'm, I'm so serious. I was sweating. I was shaking and I, I, I said something and then I ran out of that pulpit. And when I sat down and calmed my sweat and my nerves down, then I was pissed. Tell the truth. 
So I couldn't wait to go to his office at the end of that service to give him a piece of my mind. So I get back there and here's what my pastor said. He said, the reason why you're nervous is because you want to be good for everybody else because it's not about you. So you got to understand. And then he also told me that God is calling me to more and I need to get over myself. And he said all this other stuff too. But here's the reason I told you that story is the reason you're nervous is because you want to be good for other people. So if you realize your why and you start thinking about why am I doing this to push you past your fear. So every time now I'm not as fearful as I used to be when I would speak and I hired a coach because I would be, I already talk fast. So when I used to get nervous, I would talk fast that nobody could understand me, right? Matter of fact, I would talk so fast, my words would all blend together and I'd be like tripping over words, trying to get them out and stutter because I was talking so fast. And so I hired a coach for that. (laughs) And my coach told me to meditate before I go on stage. Now, those of you that know me, and if you don't know me, you know me now, I'm busy. Ain't no way I'm going to close my eyes backstage while all these people are walking by me before I go on stage to speak. So what I've learned to do is meditate with my eyes open. So my team laughs at me because they'll ask me a question and I'll nod my head really slow. They're like, you're meditating? And I nod my head really slow. I'm trying to meditate, right? So so you've got to, number one, learn some strategies to push through your fear. But even when you don't have them, it took me years to find that coach. I was more committed, just like David. I was more committed to my people than I am my own fear. Hmm. That makes sense such good sense because you're in service to others. You're not doing right. it for yourself. Right. Right. I always tell, I always say, if God wanted you to just be here by yourself, he would have put you right here by yourself. Mm-hmm. But instead we were meant to be in service to one another. So that gift in you is for someone else. And it's the answer to their need, their challenge. It's an answer to a prayer. So many people have been praying and every day you put your own needs, your own fear and you make that more important than answering someone's needs, then you, you're you late for work. You're late in being the woman that God put you on this earth to be. Man. So before you had that experience where you went with your friend to church, had you even considered taking a shift and doing something other than what you were doing and enjoying? <laughs> Yeah, I'm laughing because, yes. Yeah, so the first career that I thought I was supposed to do. So when I had that epiphany, even even to be honest with you, this is why it took me three years of shift. So even after I had a moment in the church that night and I felt alive and I was like, yes, I couldn't figure out how I was going to make money at this thing. Right. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, I like to shop. So maybe I'm meant to be a stylist. I love clothes. Mm-hmm. Now, keep in mind, I still do love clothes. Right. Mm-hmm. So because I worked on sets, I knew a lot of wardrobe department folks. Right. So I went to the head of wardrobe and the TV show I was working on at the time. And I asked her, could I volunteer, you know, like intern to try it out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, she was so excited because she saw me work every day. She's like, oh, you have great style. you will be great. So the first assignment she gave me, and this was a movie I was working on. Now, mind you, this is not what a typical first assignment is. She gave me. Uh, a shopping, you know, I need you to go for the main character, go buy her. And she told me who the character was. I was like, oh, I got that. That's not a problem. She gave me her Neiman Marcus studio service. Now, let me tell you guys, those that don't, because I didn't know what it was then. So what it is, is a badge. And you walk in Neiman, they see that little studio service badge. They take you to this private room. They hand you a glass of champagne and they bring clothes Mm -hmm. to you. I was like, oh, heck yeah, I could do this (laughs) every day. Right. So I did that the first day and I was like, yes, this is it. This is it. But let me tell you, the second and the third day, I had to pick people's underwear off the floor. I had to steam mm-hmm. people's clothes. I was like, oh, heck to the no. I ain't meant to do this. <laughs> so, so I did try some other things and nothing was fitting. Now, there's a fierce framework that I walk my clients through that if you don't mind, Trina, I'll, I'll share, um, share real quickly because literally this is what I had to learn. Well, these, it's like it took me too long to figure this out. And I, I really share this with women so you don't have to take as long to figure out where you're supposed to be. So first, The first and it's four P's. The first P is what are you passionate about? Mm -hmm. So the thing about it is I'm passionate about shopping. Really great, really passionate about shopping. I'm passionate and I can see people's gifts in them. I've always been that girl. So I worked in casting. That's really what I did. I could see an actor's gift and I could say, do it this way. And it'd be perfect or not. Or I could say, "Mm -mm, he's not good or she's not good before they could even read the script because I'm wired like that. So really Mm -hmm. in business now, I can see your gift and create multiple streams of income around it. It's, It's easy. That's the way I'm created, right? So the first thing is passion. What are you passionate about? The second thing is proficient. Now, (laughs) what are you proficient in? 
So with the shopping piece, now I realized in that moment, day two and day three, at the same time, I was taking this, um, this uh, fashion merchandising class at a junior college, right? <laughs> and in that, that, that class, they were having me pick out materials and thread count. And I was like, I don't care about the count. And I don't care about material. Is it cute or not cute? So I started realizing that I wasn't skilled at this. It's either cute or not cute. And then I realized I know how to pick stuff out for Trina. I only know how to pick out stuff for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. So passion and proficiency has to correlate. Because without both of those being present, then you can't, number three, solve a problem. So for me, if I'm going to be a stylist, which is what I was headed to, I'm going to answer to somebody's problem. But if I can't pick out clothes for you, then girl, bye, sit down somewhere. You, you can't, mm-hmm. you're not proficient in it. So what I began to realize is I started doing the work of what do I absolutely love? I love to see the light go off in women's eyes when I see their purpose. I can really create a business around it. I love it. When I can show you how to take your intellectual property and build an empire from it, right? So that leads to number four, which is how do you make a profit? So literally, in order for you to live in your purpose every day, you've got to have all four of those present without, and so many people run a profit, girl, you can't get to profit if you don't know your passion and proficiency Mm -hmm. and what problem it solves Mm -hmm. before you can make money from it. So for me, (laughs) in my previous career, when I thought I wanted to be a wardrobe or a fashion stylist or, you know, something in clothing, I realized that I love it, but I'm not good at it for anybody else but me. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. and, and that's that's very important to know what those four P's are for you. And and I laugh when you when you talked about being a stylist because before I came to know my true calling, I tried to do a little bit of styling too. And I was like, I, I don't have time for this. And people were like, Oh no, no, I don't, I don't like this. I, don't, I was like, you know what? I don't have time for this. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so and like, I look at my I, best friend, and she's a stylist, and she's so patient. Right. She's patient with people. and She'll explain things. And I'm like, either it's cute or it's not. Girl, take that off. Well, right. And I can't explain to you why it doesn't look good. It just doesn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and then yeah. sometimes I can't tell you what you should put on. So sometimes I'll be with my, my girlfriend and she's like, OK, sit down. Book stylist, you, you're making <laughs> recommendations. You don't know what you're doing. I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I could do a great job for myself. I can talk outfits together for me. But I just, you know, I had to realize that I wasn't good at it for anybody else but me. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And and so many people, and I, and I find that people, they'll say, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. And it's like, oh, okay, you do. You really, what have you, what have you, you know, started to do to get to that point? Yeah. And they've done nothing. Yeah. Or they're just thinking, oh, well, you know, it's just going to, you know, happen. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> what? <laughs> right. You know, what's funny when you said that what just came into my mind was a client, a woman that wanted to hire me and she was a lawyer. So I was like, great, we're going to take her legal expertise and we're going to monetize it. And I, can, and I can always think of at least 10 ways I can monetize your gift. That's just, again, how I'm wired. So I'm so excited. So then she starts telling me she wants to help mothers depressed. So I said, okay, so tell me about your expertise around that. She goes, what do you mean? Have you taken a class? Do you have a degree? Do you? She was like, I read a book. That's it. You read one book. I said, girl, bye. I said, just because <laughs> you read a book, you are not an expert. So if I pick up any book, if I read Becoming by Michelle Obama, am I an expert? Now I could be the first lady of the United States. Girl, bye. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. you got to have some life experience behind it in order to then create a, pro- a program or a business around it. Exactly. And yeah, nobody wants, no one wants someone that who just read a book. I, I can take a class for, some, you know, with somebody who just read a book. Right, right. And it takes a few classes, like even for me, you know, even though this is the way I'm wired, when I worked in casting, again, it helped me see my gift is really pulling out the best in people. I went from casting to talent management. And even then I was doing it. So then when I left the entertainment industry altogether, and I went back to, so when I started doing this program with teenage girls, I loved it, right? I'm still trying to figure out what this thing is, because there was no such thing as a coach. So I started reading one ads. And every one ad, I thought I was a manager. Let me keep it all the way real because that's all I could figure out, right? Mm-hmm. So every job I wanted, I needed an MSW. I'm like, what the heck is that? I'm coming from my bachelor's degrees in entertainment. It's in drama, matter of fact, for TV and film. So I have a little acting in me too. And yes, I'm full of drama. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I keep getting these these one ads and everyone says MSW. So to make a long story short, I finally get a job interview. The woman has an MSW on her wall, which is a master's in social work. So uh-huh. I figured since I can get this job either, I needed to go get one of those. Now, here's the reason I'm telling you this. As I'm sitting in my social work class, now the first year is clinical. 
And and the thing you have to know about me is is and although I've been trained clinically, if I make a recommendation, you you keep doing the same thing twenty times, I can't with you. If you mm-hmm. want to stay stuck, I'm not the girl that stays stuck with you that let you lay on the couch and keep talking about the same thing. That's not me. I want to shake you. Right. Mm-hmm. So I realized I can't do this work. And so I was getting frustrated. My first client was eight. She had a crack addicted mom. I was like her sixth social worker and she would stare at me for an hour. It's like, oh, oh, heck no, I can't do this. Right. So I started exploring what else could I do. And there was something called COPA, Community Organizing Planning Administration. I said, that's it. That's it. Because really, I love developing programs. I love, you know, taking people's gifts again and creating programs around us. I said, that's it. So I'm sitting in these classes, Trina, and and telling you all things work together, not some. Mm. And I'm sitting in these classes and I'm seeing how program development is really gift, which is the same producing gift and casting gift I had in entertainment. So I'm only telling you that story. Because I couldn't do what I do now had I not gone through all those iterations of training, of mm. seeing what my gift is, of trying it out for a while. You know, these kids that come straight out of college and think, well, I want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, what expertise do you have? You just fit in school, right? right? Now, it's one thing to start a brick and mortar business. I get that. But when you're trying to look at an intellectual property business as a coach, as a consultant, as some kind of um, image consultant, trainer or anything, right? Um, lawyer, accountant, in order for you to move that business forward, you've got to have some expertise behind you. Mm-hmm. Even if you wanted to be a corporate, you know, sales coach, well, you've worked in corporate and probably done some sales. And so you could take that intellectual property that you begin to paycheck for and create a business, your own business around it. But you can't graduate on Monday and think on Tuesday, yeah, mm-hmm, I'm going to start an intellectual property business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. See, I already see what kind of coach you are. You're like, <laughs> no, don't waste my time. <laughs> this is how I'll it tell is. truth. I, here's the thing. I will always tell you the truth. So that particular woman that was a lawyer, I said to her, you know, so uh, when I started, I asked questions. I, I hope that they can pull out that they're in the wrong direction from the questions that I asked. It was like adamant. Nope. I read a book. I'm passionate about it. I said, okay. So then I said to her, so understand now here's the blessing that I'm a social worker. Cause I know frustrating is when you go to dark places with people and I want you to come out quick and you don't, you've got to be willing and able to stay in that dark place with people. Mm-hmm. And all transformation on a personal development level is not easy. And you got to be right. willing to stay there until she comes out. Cause if not, you leave them worse than when they started with you. Mm-hmm. So when I said that to her, I said, so here's my suggestion to you, go get a master's degree in counseling. Cause if that's what you want to do, you need to have the expertise to stay in the dark place with people. And you, Oh, you in a dark place. I don't want to serve you. That personal development is all about that. And you've got to be willing to serve it. Right. Mm -hmm. And and be equipped to do it. (laughs) Wow. Wow. So I see that's, that's how you take your, your clients and you, you build them and you take them to where they, they need to be. You're saying, okay, Mm -hmm. here's the truth. What do you have? What can we work with? And let's build upon it. Exactly. You know, so many people, uh, you know, you can, see you. You don't serve. You always say, you don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I think I want to be Trina today. You're, mm-hmm. treat on, you're Trina on autopilot, just like I'm Nicole on autopilot. So for me, there are things that I do that are intrinsic to who I be. Just like the same for you, Trina, just like all of you that are listening. So there are things you do you don't realize you do. So the great thing about having a coach is that they hold a mirror at you and then they can see what you can't see about you, right? Mm-hmm. So even if I use another client as an example, a woman um, that was in my um, group coaching program. So she comes in and sometimes it's a blessing that the way God wired me is I can see people's purpose and sometimes they don't feel like it. I'm going to tell you why. Because this woman is talking about this life coaching skill she has and I'm thinking, mm, it doesn't feel right in my spirit. So mind you, this is our first group coaching call. So I said, so who told you you had to be, you had to be a life coach? And she goes, excuse me? So I'm like, oh Lord, in front of everybody else, she's about to fire me. <laughs> So I, I, and I can feel it in my spirit. So I'm like, who told you you had to be a life coach? I said, because when I look at social media, you're doing everything, but I mm-hmm. said, what, what lights your soul on fire is being a trainer, a health trainer. Cause I mean, she's in it. Right. And so then she starts crying. I'm like, Oh Lord, what did I do? So, you know, I finished the group, you know, other people ask questions. I hung the phone up, called her back and she goes, Oh my God, Nicole, you're so right. I love training people. But you're somebody told me, I said, so here's the thing. If you want to use so your life coaching certificate is not in vain, you can do mind, body, soul, fitness. 
because you can't get your body right if your mind is not in alignment. She was like, oh, but and, and, and I'm only sharing that with you because literally for me, it's more than just you paying me. I will watch you. And my, some of my clients call it stalking. I call it watching. <laughs> but my goal is I want to see you in and I want to get to know who you be because it's your being. You know, we walk around calling ourselves human beings, but we're not. We're actually human doing. So we're so focused on what we do, do, do that we, sh- we, we shift and, and we don't even ever focus on our being. And it's the being that matters. And so what I focus on is who you be at the core of your core. What oozes out of you that sets your soul on fire? Wow. So how do you get to that point for the listeners where, like you said, someone told her you should be a coach when she mm-hmm. knew and everything pointed to being a trainer? How do you help that person? And what do you have for the listeners that are in that same place where they're like, no, I want to do this. But people are saying, no, you should do this. And maybe people are telling them that because it's sexy or it makes more money. But they or know sometimes passion. As people are saying that because they don't know what else to call it. Let me just say that to you. Right. So it's not okay. that the person's giving you wrong suggestions. They just don't know how to package what you do. And sometimes doing something outside of the box they definitely like people can call me a life coach i'm not a life coach i don't even call myself a coach what i do is i help women align their purpose paycheck because when you say coach it's all of a sudden life and i don't help you with their life i help you with your business Mm -hmm. right i really i help you with your purpose and so what i will first i want to give your listeners with a quiz that you can take to see where you are in your journey it's my fierce roadmap quiz. You just answer the questions that'll tell you whether you're in stage one, where you aren't clear on your purpose, whether you're in stage two, you're ready to start, and whether you're in stage three and you've been in business and, and you, you know, you need to make more money, right? And then it, from that, it'll give you even more once you understand your stage. Because the other thing I realize is people give you a blanket answer and you, everybody's in different places. So go to fierce roadmapquiz.com and take the quiz. Again, that's fierce, as in Sasha, fierce roadmap quiz.com. And, and for, for me, it's, it's the, the fierce framework I shared earlier. What are you passionate about? Now, if you're not sure, I'm going to give you some homework, right? Mm-hmm. If you're not sure, I want you to look at your day. When you were working at your job, there's a moment any given day where you're like, I like this. Like, it feels really good. Stop and notice that and write down what the heck you're doing. What made you feel good? What was it that you loved? What was it you loved about it? I'm big on journals. So if you can give yourself 10 to 20 minutes, you know, after you put the kids to bed for the moms, right? Give yourself 20 minutes every night and think about your day. And what did you love about your day? What did you absolutely hate doing that you never want to do again? Mm-hmm. Oh, Lord, let's not do that anymore, right? So pay attention to that. The second thing, when you look at your proficiency, your boss usually calls you to ask you, you know, put you on special assignments or your friends, you know, whether it's your girlfriends want to pick your brain or run something past you. That's because they see, I call it that light in you. I really call it the lighthouse effect. So think about what a lighthouse is. When it's dark on the ocean, a lighthouse, what it does is it shines a light so that the boat can come to shore. So what people see, and the reason why people want to always run some past you or tease something out with you is they see that light and you can pull them sure of their solution. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So start paying attention when people, even, you know, if you're on committees and you're in organizations, they keep volunteering you. Like my husband always volunteers me, like when he's at some meeting to organize events, really. You didn't even call me. But, but again, that's, I'm great at putting programs together, right? Mm-hmm. So, so when people are coming, for things, notice that. That's what you're proficient in. So when you start looking at that you love and you it, just because you're good at something doesn't mean you need to do it. Like right. Michelle Obama talks about this in Becoming. She talked about the fact that she realized that she was really great at being a lawyer, but she hated it. Mm-hmm. So so understand, but her legal skills helped her. She mm-hmm. was a phenomenal first lady. I know because her butt went to Harvard Law. <laughs> right. right? So, right. So, so begin to really look at that and spend time with yourself in your being. Spend time with you and, and your soul will tell you where you're supposed to be. Wow. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't do that. I think a lot of people don't know themselves. So they don't spend time with themselves. Right. So they, they can't discern what it is that they should be doing. 
And, and then they, even if you do turn to Trina, dare I say, because this was me and I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to talk about me. So even in that moment in 1993, when I realized that I was supposed to be doing this thing, I was worried about perception. I was worried about how am I going to explain to people what the heck this is when I don't know what the heck it is. It took me three years because I was so concerned with what people had to say or what people had to do. And I got to the point where I said, you know what? I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, dad. I'm sorry, community. I'm sorry, girlfriends. I let you control me. And that was my fault. But I'm going to take my control back now. Thank you. And mm. I stopped caring what people thought. But it took me a minute to get to that. It took me a minute, some counseling, <laughs> some soul mm-hmm. searching, some Jesus time. You know, it took me some time to get there. But you've got to decide that you being the answer to the people that need you is bigger than perception or living in this land of, of, of shoulds, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that you can get past that. Wow. Wow. That is great. So... I have a question going back to your previous career and then you're deciding to shift to do what you're doing now. Did that help you or did you have any connections that helped you along the way? Or did you just say, you know what, I'm at ground zero and I'm starting this new thing and I'm building from there? I would say I didn't have any connections. However, what I did have is an inquisitive spirit. So I started asking questions. So Mm -hmm. how I even found out what an MSW was. Um, well, I found out, I told you in that interview, but then I started asking friend questions. So I had a girlfriend who I didn't even know was looking at master's in psychology courses, right? And she's a counselor, she's a school counselor now. And this was somebody that was going to dental school at the same time. And so I was telling her, I saw this MSW master social work and I don't know about that. And so she's like, oh, I have a friend that went to, M- that has an MSW, you should talk to her. So mm-hmm. I started like sharing with people. I, we, especially as black women, Mm-hmm. Don't always share when we feel like we're in a place of, 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 how do I say this? So when perception, and I, I have this big title and I'm working on every TV show and every movie that y'all can even imagine. And this other little thing I'm doing on side is nowhere near glamorous like that. So right. when you're worried about perception, you don't want to talk about it. So I had to let go of what people were saying, especially in that moment where I had been doing it for three years now. And now I really want to do it as a full-time job is why I was looking for want to ask because I was doing it as a volunteer and I started having to have conversations and started sharing. And even now, and for women, it's easier for us to do this. Men, it's harder. But even now when I'm trying to grow my business, I've got to talk to people that have businesses that are 10 steps ahead of me. That's why I always have a coach because if I don't have someone that's teaching me and shedding a light on my path as I grow, how am I going to shed a light on somebody else's path as they grow? Right. Right. And that's one of the things that I tell people is you have to talk to other people because just like you're saying, you never know who knows what and may be able to help you. They may not be able to help you directly, but they may know someone. Like you said, yeah. your friends like, oh, I know someone that has that degree. You should talk to that person so they can give exactly. you a little more insight on that. And right. you're right. We don't we don't do that. And I and I had to do that with myself and say, you know what, maybe I should start talking to people. And everyone is not worthy of you sharing your dreams and your passions with. Right, right. But there are some people that are excited to hear that you do have a passion that you're working to get to. And they'll say, well, oh, OK, yeah, I, I know someone that I can you know, recommend you to or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's all about getting out there and and speaking and telling people that this is what you're trying to do. And you never know what doors may open for you. Right, right, right. The Bible verse says you have not because you ask not. And had I not asked, because still, even though I saw on the wall, masters of social work. Now, keep in mind, when I hear social worker, and some of you guys probably thought this too, I think of people that take people's kids. I'm like, I don't mm-hmm. want to do that, right? Mm-hmm. But there's so many, there's so many areas of social work that you don't even know. You know, many social workers are executive directors running the clinics or running the shelters or running the programs. And that's what I learned how to do. And, and really, many social workers, what I did, I had a, a consulting firm for years. And even, mm-hmm. let me say this to you, had I not gone to social work school and learned how to do program development, this is what shifted everything. I remember, this was in 1998, the speaker of the state of California had developed this program. And it was called Healthy Families and Nobody. I mean, it was low-cost no cost health insurance. And nobody was signing up for it. So he, he called this Who's Who of LA to this meeting. And I got invited. And I was like, how did I get invited to this Meeting, right. And so now I'm a, I'm a social worker and I'm working in, in, I have a consulting firm at the time going into businesses to develop programs and it was going in, into nonprofits. And so to, I'm a real quick story. The speaker, chief of staff makes this presentation and, and, and what he says is they're in the mall 
And those of you that are familiar with LA, the Foxwoods Mall from 10 to 2. And I'm like, wait a minute, Monday through Friday. So if I don't make enough to afford insurance, but my job doesn't pay for insurance, why would I be in the mall from 10 to 2, Monday through Friday? Mm -hmm. And so literally I rose my little hand and I said that. And I said, why are you not going to after school programs? Why are you not at the grocery store on the weekend? Why are you? I started naming all these places that, you know, parents go to because this is a program for parents. And just like that, they made a program and enrollment increased in 85 percent. That is how I moved from for profit, excuse me, from nonprofit to for profit, because then he started recommending me working for for profits. And I was, oh, my God, I have a gift for programs that I can see where people are totally leaving transformation behind. So mm-hmm. it shifted. I mean, so every step I make, like trying to grow this gift, is how I got to the place now that I now am helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Wow. That is, I- I'm loving all of this. And you're saying turning people's purpose into their profit. And mm-hmm. you say, I think I read on your website about the multiple income streams. Can you touch mm-hmm. a little bit on that? Sure. Um, so what I had to learn in my own business, let me tell you, so I've been doing this 26 years. I struggled way too long. And it's because I only had one, one revenue stream in my business, right? I was like, how do I say this? So, so I was only coaching. So when you only have a one-to-one model in your business, whether you're a lawyer and you only work one-to-one, if you're a coach, if you are a consultant, so that means that everything I did, I had to be present. So if that's the case, if I only have eight hours of working day, first of all, you don't see eight people in a day. You got to have time to write a note and an email and a follow up. So I'm already leaving or capping how much money I can make. So in order for your business to grow to hit six figures, seven figures, you've got to have multiple ways you can serve people, some of which are ways that you are not present. So matter of fact, right now, Trina, I'm talking to you and somebody's going through my online program and I'm not there. I'm here with you. So it's really looking at how do I take my brilliance and create a formula from it? And this is really what I teach my clients. And from that formula, how do we create multiple ways to serve people? Now, let me give you a more tangible example. Uh, Deborah Tillman, who is the uh, super, nana, super nanny, America's super nanny. I met her at a conference. She, to make a long story short, she hired me to coach her. And the reason was she couldn't figure out how she could serve more parents. Again, can't add any more hours in a day. Can't clone yourself. So how do you... Mm-hmm. Um, really find a model that you can serve more people. Plus she speaks. Plus, I don't know if people realize that she owns childcare centers and thing. Not, I think she owns like three or four. And oh. so how does she write? And so literally um, I gave her, first of all, she's sitting out for is really sweet. So when I say the sassy, understand Nicole is sassy and Deborah is not. So, so, and this is how I received it. So I'm talking to her on her first call and I talked about, you know, we need to create a formula. And she's like, well, I, I can't do that. Because I specialize, you know, anytime I'm working with a parent, I said, okay, so that's a story. And I just knew she was going to fire me. That's a story you're telling yourself. Are you ready to realize that there is a formula and that we get to create it again? Everybody's on autopilot. You don't realize what you do because you don't do it to you. Right. Mm. I gave her some homework, same homework I give to every client. And literally she came to our next call in tears because she didn't realize that there is a myth that we can now take a package. And and so we took that, we created a method. She has a system now. It's called the uh, GPS Greater Parenting System that she now has online programs and group programs. And so what happens when you do that, you stop leaving families behind for her. But for you, you stop leaving people behind that can't afford highs because coaching with her is not cheap, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But also, so now she can downsell them into another way to say yes to them. So you stop leaving transformation on the table, stop leaving the money on the table too. So every business, I believe, should have six streams of income so that you can, again, serve all the people that need you. And there's various different ways they need you too. Wow. And and that's very important in because you can only do so much. Like you say, you only have so many hours in a day and you can't be everywhere. So you need some other things going on. Right. And that's the whole I, P. The fourth P is really looking at what's your platform to profit and what are all the different ways we can package your brilliance into all the ways you can serve the world. Now, I can talk to you all night, but we're coming to the end of our <laughs> hour. So I'm going to roll into my questions for you. Okay. And I think you're going to enjoy them. Yay. So who or what motivates you? Who or what motivates me? You know, I think my biggest motivation, well, there's two people. One, of course, I'm going to say Beyonce. And the reason I'm saying I'm going to say Beyonce is because she always outdoes herself. 
I mean, this girl just released this big uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when she did the album in the middle of the night, the thing I love about Beyonce is she doesn't sit in, okay, yeah, I did that. She's always working to her next level. The second person that I would say is Madam C.J. Walker. And the reason I say that is at a time when black folks were being lynched, this woman was training other women to begin their own businesses in addition to her being the first, one of the first, you know, millionaires as a woman. But Mm -hmm. I mean, literally she was traveling and training other women how to start a business when we were being lynched. Mm. So yeah, I never thought about it like that. Right. Right. What demotivates you? People that, that sitting good enough, that playing mediocre, that, you know, settle. Oh, I hate that. Mm. Okay. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked for your good? Mm. I think I, when someone said or did, I, what the first thing that came to my mind was when I was little. So I'm a light-skinned African-American woman. And I remember being teased called white girl, right? And I remember coming home and my mom, you know, my mom's light-skinned, my dad's light-skinned, my mother had a whole fit, right? So I thought I was in trouble, but she snatched me up and started telling me black come in different shades and colors. And so in that moment, I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel like I fit in. I didn't feel like, you know, and I never told anybody. And so me not feeling like I was good enough traveled with me through high school, elementary, high school, into, you know, who I would date in my 20s. And I, and the only reason I said it worked for my good is because when that moment, when I found my fears, that moment when I had that epiphany, it was like all those things that were hindering me, all the weeds that were trying to choke out the seeds of my purpose made me that much stronger. Hmm. Okay. What is your fear? Hmm. That I will die and not have lived fully into uh, the purpose that God created me to be. Like I will not have been able to serve all the women I know on purpose to serve. Okay. Is there a time when you wished you had done something that you didn't? Yep. So when I was in college, (laughs) I really (laughs) wanted to go to Howard. True talk. All my friends went to Howard and I was scared. So I didn't. I let fear stop me. So I went to San Diego State because it was easy. So then I tried to transfer. And my mother was like, no. So I was just teasing with my, one of my best girlfriends the other day who went to Howard that, you know, I want to come to homecoming because every year I, I can't look at my Facebook that weekend because all my friends went. So I feel like I'm left out and then I regret that I didn't do it at the beginning when they did it because I let fear stop me, you know. And so every time I'm afraid of something, I realize I got to do it. I don't ever want to live in that kind of regret ever again. Mm. Is there a time that you wish you had not done something? Mm, that's a good question. I'm sure there's plenty of times. I, well, I can think of guys I, I wish I had not dated. Um, <laughs> but to be yeah. honest with you, every failure I've ever had, I've learned something. So I mm-hmm. wouldn't take anything back because every failure has given me a great opportunity to grow. Mm, yes. What is your definition of success? My definition of success is you being unapologetically who you are, despite what you can see, despite what other people say that you should be, and that you are willing to do everything you're called to do and do it. Okay. How do you recharge? Oh, I love laying at the beach. Love it, love it, love it. So at least twice a year, well, I should say I love water. Twice a year, we try to take a beach vacation, but my husband and I had our midlife crisis and got a pool put in our house um, a couple of years ago. So during the summer, it's like we can't wait for the pool to open. So for me, it's just laying by, a, a, you know, whether it's a beach or water. And then at least once a month, I get a massage. Okay. What are you awesome at? Ooh, let's see. There's so many things now. Um, I think that I'm an awesome friend because I have such fun with my girlfriends. I know that I'm an awesome coach, that I that I really am committed to the gift in you and I'm not committed to you liking me in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like my one of my clients called me a, a, a midwife because she's like, girl, you push us, you make us push it out. So I think um, I'm awesome at that. I think I'm, I'm, I'm an awesome child of God. I want to make God proud of me. That's my biggest mission in this thing called life. Wow. What legacy do you want to leave? When I leave this earth, I want people to remember me as a woman that held the space for other women to truly live into all that they were born to be. Okay. So if you could leave the listeners with one motivational takeaway, what would it be? 
to, to, that's a good question. Let's see. One motivational takeaway that now is your time. You can't put off. You can't make any excuses about why you can't. It's look at why can you, why should you, and, and dare to do it afraid. Wow. Okay. So Nicole, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you, your social media platforms, or if they need a coach, what do they need to do to get to you? <laughs> so social media, um, Instagram, I am in Roberts Jones, best way, because I post in social in Instagram more than any place else. Again, in my name is too long. So it's first initial in Roberts Jones. On Facebook, I am the Fierce Factor Lab with Nicole Roberts Jones. And then if you want to work with me, first of all, take the fierce roadmap quiz.com because you will be in my database if you haven't figured it out. You will get information. <laughs> but um, you can also go look at Nicole Roberts Jones.com. Um, and if there's any way I can serve you, I would love to be your coach. And then you have to know those of you that are like, she has to be my coach. The way my team and I work is we always have you apply because we want to serve you, not sell you. And we want to make sure that we are the best fit for you, whether it's me or someone else with that recommendation. Wow. Okay. Well, I could go on talking to you for a while, but yeah, I, know, fast. <laughs> I know, but I know you are a busy lady. So I just want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and just dropping those gems for us. Well, thank you for doing uh, what you're doing, Trina, for really holding the space for women to get what they need to be motivated and inspired and activated. All right. Thank if you. you're looking for a speaker for your live event or conference, go to my website and read my bio and contact me at bit.ly forward slash book Trina. I hope you have a great week. Until then, remember, if you change your mindset, you'll change your life. Keep striving. Success is a journey, not a destination. You can listen to Trina Talk anytime and anywhere. It's available on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spotify, and all other places that you can listen to podcasts. If you like the podcast, please don't forget to go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, review, and share. If you have questions for me or need inspiration on how to go to the next level, tweet me directly at Trina L. Martin.